All right, so let's talk about momentum. Um, if you're following along with me because you were absent, uh, then you obviously need to write these notes down as though you were in class. Uh, if you're just using this for a refresher, then um, either follow along in your notes or probably what would be better is if you went back through and worked the problems uh, with me again on you know clean paper. So uh, let's go ahead and get our definition stuff out of the way. The momentum is the product of the mass and the velocity that an object has. It's a vector, so that means it's got magnitude and direction. Uh, we have a boxed equation here, which means I'm going to give it to you on any quiz or test. Uh, so that's obviously mass times velocity. In standard units, uh, the units to be kilogram meters per second. Okay, kilograms because that's the unit for mass and meters per second because that's the unit for velocity. That does not turn into a new unit like we're kind of getting used to, to seeing happen with you know, joules um, for energy and uh, you know, that kind of from, from Newton meters and, and that kind of stuff. This just stays kilogram meters per second. So it's kind of a weird unit for momentum. Now let's talk about where momentum came from. This actually comes from Newton's second law and you know Newton's second law as mass times acceleration, but that's not actually how he originally wrote his second law. He originally wrote his second law in terms of momentum, and then we worked it uh, backwards so that we could come up with this formula that I had you memorize. So we're going to go the other way and see how uh, Newton originally wrote his equation and based it off of momentum. So um, up here on the top, we have mass times final velocity minus mass times initial velocity. So I could actually take the top part of this equation here and I could factor the mass out. All right? So I'd have mass times final velocity minus initial velocity. Okay? And I could go even further and we know that if you have the final minus the initial that that's the change in something. So we could say the mass times the change in velocity. All right, so we've got um, we've got mass times acceleration here, and on the top we could end up with mass times the change in velocity, and then of course on the bottom you still have change in time. And we know that the change in velocity divided by the change in time that is the acceleration. So this is still a true statement here. Okay, and then we can go uh, use our formula for momentum that we just got. We know that momentum is equal to mass times velocity. So I can expand this. I can say right here, mass times final velocity, that's final momentum. And mass times initial velocity, that's initial momentum. And if I have final minus initial, then that's the change in. So Newton's uh, second law was actually written like this down here. The force of impact, and that's a net force, uh, but the force of impact is equal to the change in momentum over the change in time. And hopefully you can work your way mathematically back and see that that's actually the same thing as saying mass times acceleration. So we've talked about it in terms of F net. We're applying it to you know any kind of a net force. But in this momentum section, we're going to actually talk about it in terms of what we call the force of impact. Um, and that's only going to be during a collision, okay? Uh, so, you know, two things have to be hitting each other for that to be true. And that's going to be the force that's being applied to one of the objects in the collision. Now, of course, we know that Newton's third law says that, uh, you know, the forces are going to be equal, equal and opposite to each other but we're really only calculating the force on one of the objects and, and then of course we could apply Newton's third law and know that that's actually going to be the same magnitude um, uh, on, on whatever object. Like let's say we you know, throw a ball on the ground. Okay, We calculate the force of impact on the ball. We actually also calculated the force of impact on the ground. It's just going to be in the opposite direction. Okay, let's move on. Practice question. Uh, find the force of impact. Okay, so that means we're probably going to want the equation for force of impact. So find the force of impact um, when the guy on the desk bends his knees after stepping off of a lab table. 
Okay, so a couple things that I want to talk to you about here. Um, there are two situations, okay? At this point, when the guy is, you know, he stepped off the lab table and he's on his way down to the ground, he hasn't collided with anything yet. So none of this right here, none of this section has anything to do with momentum, all right? It is only once the guy actually lands on the ground here that we get some kind of a, a collision. And that is when we would start applying our momentum um, equation, okay? And then another thing that's really important in these momentum problems is when they give you a time, that is the time duration of the collision, okay? It's not how long it takes the object to get up to the point where it's going to collide. It's the time that it takes for the object to do the colliding, to be involved in the, the crash until it comes to a stop, okay? So if we're talking about this guy's jumping off the table, all right? His initial velocity up here, since he's just stepping off the table there, that's going to be zero meters per second. That is not the velocity that we're going to plug into our momentum equation because he's not colliding yet, okay? But he makes his way down here and he hits the ground. I need to know what that uh, velocity is when he hits the ground because we have our equation for the force of impact and that equation says that it is the change in momentum over the change in time. And remember, this time right here is the duration of the collision. Okay? Now, we need to expand this delta P term here, okay? The change in. That's going to be P final minus P initial. All right? So the final momentum minus the initial momentum over the change in time, okay? Now let's expand that again. Force of impact is equal to, I need to use my formula for momentum, which is momentum equals mass times velocity, to expand each of these uh, momentum variables there, okay? So I'm going to say the mass of the guy times the final velocity minus the mass of the guy times the initial, uh, whoops, the initial velocity. And then divide that by the duration of the collision. And then I hope that you recognize that you can factor the guy's mass out of that equation. I'm going to slide this over a little bit. So I can say that force of impact is equal to the mass times the final velocity of the collision, because this has to do with momentum, minus the initial velocity of the collision, divided by the change in time. Okay? Now, this initial velocity right here, that's the initial velocity of the collision. So that is not this velocity up here, because he's not colliding. He starts colliding down here. I wasn't given that piece of information. I don't know what his initial velocity was when he first ran into the ground. But I do think that I could figure out what his velocity is uh, after the collision. What do you think that's going to be after he stops colliding? Hopefully you are uh, shouting out zero to your computer screen right now. So, uh, and that's correct, they're going to stop colliding so he's going to come to a rest. All right. I have to calculate, though, this initial velocity. And I hope that by now I've given you enough time to think your way through this problem while I'm talking at you. And hopefully you recognize that you know this person's initial velocity. You know that they've stepped off of the, the lab counter there, so they're going to be considered an object in free fall, which means we will know their acceleration is negative little g. So that's negative 9.8. 81 meters per second squared. Uh, we know the displacement of the person as they move down, okay? We know that it's going to be delta y equals, they're moving down, so it's a negative number. And then, of course, we don't want centimeters, we want meters, so we're going to move that back to 0.91 meters. 
And you remember that if you have any three kinematic variables, you can solve for the other two. And what we really want is the final velocity at the end of the free fall. And the final velocity at the end of the free fall is actually going to turn out to be the initial velocity at the beginning of the collision. Okay? So, let's go figure out what, that's, what that is. All right? Let's see. I think we've got final velocity squared equals initial velocity squared plus 2 times acceleration times delta y. And we want to solve for the final velocity of the free fall. Okay, so we're going to take the square root of both sides. So final velocity equals, and whenever you take the square root, you have to put a plus or minus. And in our situation, we know the direction that the guy is moving in. So are we going to choose the plus or are we going to choose the minus here? Okay, hopefully you said the minus. He's moving downward. All right, so let's plug that information into our calculators. And I am coming up with negative 4.22542 zero five five seven meters per second as the final velocity uh, of the free fall okay and that's actually going to be equal to the initial velocity of the collision okay so that's uh, this number right here that's what we're going to plug in right there all right so let's do that the force of impact is equal to the mass of our jumper. It's going to be 68 kilograms times the final velocity after the collision, 0 meters per second, minus negative 4.22 blah, blah, blah meters per second, divided by the, the duration of the collision. And we were told that that's going to be this 0 .300 seconds here. Okay, So let's put that down here, 0 .300 seconds. All right, so let's type that into our calculator and come up with an answer. Okay, so when I do that um, with sig figs, I'm ending up with 960 newtons as my force of impact on uh, the jumper. Okay, now let's go ahead and convert that into pounds just so we can see how many pounds of force is acting on that jumper. All right, now of course I'm not going to use my sig fig answer, I'm going to use every digit that the calculator is giving me. So 957.762. Five five nine three zero one point six three. We'll say newtons over one. And now here's your conversion factor to get from newtons to pounds. And no, you do not have to memorize this number. Uh, I would give it to you if I wanted you to make this conversion. Okay. So let's make that conversion, and with the right sig figs, um, tell me a, uh, how many pounds of, of force would be on this jumper. Okay, I'm coming up with 220 pounds of force. All right. So you know, like I don't know if you go to the gym and you're doing like leg day, and you're pushing uh, pushing out on that that machine. Um, to build up your leg muscles and you have 220 pounds uh, on the machine, that's what you would experience if you jumped off the, the countertop and bent your knees on the way down and you know all the variables of this problem stayed consistent. Okay, and Now we have a little secondary question up here. What if the guy doesn't bend his knees? Okay, And if he doesn't bend his knees, he keeps them locked when he jumps off the thing. The collision only lasts for half of a millisecond. Instead of the collision uh, time being stretched out to 0.3 seconds, 
now the collision only takes half a millisecond. All right? We're going to do the same exact calculation, but we're going to plug that new uh, scenario in. Okay? So we've got the force of impact is equal to the 68 kilogram guy times, we know that he's going to have a zero final velocity, minus negative 4 point, what is it, 225, blah, 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 over, now we want that uh, 0.5 milliseconds, but we can't use milliseconds, all right, we need to change it into just regular seconds, so we've got uh, 0.5 if you're doing dimensional analysis. You've got 0.5 uh, milliseconds on top, and then you can say 1,000 milliseconds on bottom equals one second on top. So you should end up with 0 0.0005 seconds. Okay? Type that into your calculators, and let's figure out what the force of impact in newtons would be on the um, jumper, and then we'll switch it into pounds so that you have something that you can relate to a little bit better. Okay, if um, I'm doing this in newtons, uh, and I've got uh, two sig figs, it looks like I've got 570,000 newtons of force, and if you change that into pounds, we're going to end up with 130,000 pounds of force on the, the guy's legs there. Something's going to break, okay? Nobody's legs are strong enough to withstand that much force. So as soon as he hits the ground with his legs locked like that, he, his bones are going to start shattering all the way up um, until they exhaust all of that energy. So... Always bend your, your knees when you're landing from a jump. Um, and the reason that I'm doing this problem is to illustrate to you the fact that um, the longer that you can make a collision last for, the less force of impact you're going to have. And that's, that's pretty important. That's why cars are designed the way that they're designed now. Cars are now made out of um, you know lightweight aluminum, and they're built so that the engine block of the car actually moves downward during the collision so that it doesn't move into the cabin and the, the whole front part of the car will crumple like an accordion during a collision because that takes more time. Uh, it stretches out the length of the collision and so by the time the collision has moved up to the cabin of the vehicle where you're located at, uh, hopefully the, co the collision part uh, of the, your wreck is over and you don't really experience uh, you know, that much force on your body. All the force was absorbed by the car. Same thing for airbags in your car. When an airbag deploys, it completely fills up you know, in a fraction of a second and then immediately starts deflating. The reason for that is that it blows up really big and then your head has already moved forward and is starting to make contact with the airbag and then the airbag is already starting to deflate so that your face and your head is making contact with that airbag the entire time that it's deflating that's increasing the uh, collision time so that you don't feel a very large force on your head if the airbag deployed and completely filled up and stayed filled up uh, when your head touched it, uh, as soon as your head ran into it, it would bounce right back off. That means the collision between your face and the airbag would last for just a moment in time, and your face would experience a, quite a large force, and you would probably break your face. So the airbag deflating like that in, increases that collision time, and that reduces the amount of force that your, your head or your face is um, taking on during that collision. So that's one of the things there, and that's something you need to be aware of when you are designing your egg drop project. And you're trying to make your egg survive, you don't want a very large force on that very fragile egg. So one of your tactics that you could shoot for is trying to elongate the collision time of the egg. Okay? So that's, there's a little helpful hint for you. All right, let's move on. Conservation of momentum. Okay, um, momentum is going to be conserved during all collisions and explosions, 
And an explosion, as far as physics is concerned, is just a collision in reverse. Okay? Uh, this is your conservation of momentum formula. I will give that to you on any quiz or test. Uh, this little weird symbol here in the front, uh, I can draw it for you. I'm not very good at this one. This is a capital sigma. And uh, that means sum of. Okay, so when we see sigma, that's telling us to sum everything. So I could expand this. It says the, it's the sum of the initial momentums must be equal to the sum of the final momentums. So if you've got multiple objects running into each other, then you would say, you know, I've got the initial momentum of object 1 plus the initial momentum of object 2 so on and so forth, and they have to be equal to the final momentum of object 1 plus the final momentum of object 2, so on and so forth, okay? So that's, that's how you would expand that equation. Um, and of course, remember, momentums are vector quantities. All right, so let's see if we can apply this. We have a question here. Uh, find the final velocity of piece A for this stick of dynamite. All right, so we have this piece of dynamite, and it's going to go boom. And we're going to have one piece of the dynamite fly off in this direction, and we're going to have another piece fly off in that direction, okay? Uh, you'll know how I know that they're going to go in different directions in just a minute. We know that the entire mass of the stick of dynamite is one kilogram. And when that di stick of dynamite is just sitting there, you know, right before it's going to explode, what's its velocity? Zero meters per second, just sitting there, okay? All right, then over here, we know the mass of piece A. But what's the mass of piece B? Hopefully, you realize that you could subtract the mass of piece A from the total mass of the stick of dynamite, and we would know that this mass is going to be 0.75 kilograms for piece B. All right, and so this is the last piece of information I don't know here. So now we ask ourselves, is there a collision or explosion happening here? Yes, then that means that we can use our law of conservation of momentum to figure this out. So I'm going to write that formula down, then I'm going to expand it. Uh, in the beginning, over here, I only have one object, okay? So it'll be quite easy to figure out my initial momentum. It's going to be the mass of that object times the initial velocity of the object, okay? Equals, now we're going to put our final information over here. So let's talk about uh, piece A, all right? So it's going to be the mass of piece A, which is going to be the 0.25 kilograms, times the final velocity of piece A, which I don't know, plus the mass of piece B, which is our 0.75 kilograms, times the final velocity of piece B which they tell us is 12 meters per second. Okay, now we're trying to find out this term right here, so we need to try and get that alone on one side of the equal sign, all right? So what we want to do then is subtract the momentum of piece B. So we want to subtract this term here from both sides. minus that stuff. So that cancels out over here. And then we want to divide both sides by this uh, 0.25 kilogram term here. Okay, So let me move this up a little bit. And I can say then that the final velocity of piece A is equal to um, if we look at this right here, it's just 1 times 0, so we know that's going to be 0. Uh, so it's going to be 0 minus this stuff here, so that's just going to be a negative number. So I'm going to put negative 
on the outside and then 0.75 kilograms times 12 meters per second over 0.25 kilograms. Kilograms will cancel with kilograms and we'll be left with meters per second which is the correct term or a unit for velocity so I know I've set the problem up right. So now we just need to type all that information into our calculator so we can get our final answer with the correct sig figs and hopefully if you've done that you can see that the final velocity is going to be negative 36 meters per second. Now this negative sign here means that the direction of piece A is going to be to the left which is why I knew that, you know, that arrow was pointing off that way. And it, it really just had to be. If the velocity of piece B is moving in a positive direction, the only way that momentum is going to be conserved and everything is going to add up to be um, zero over here is that piece A is going to have to move off in an opposite direction from piece B so that when we add everything back up, we'll, we would get zero, okay? So the momentum of piece, uh, or the final velocity of piece A is going to be negative 36 meters per second. So if you go back in and you take negative 36 uh, meters per second as your velocity and you multiply it by 0.25, you should get an equal and opposite momentum uh, if you took 0.75 and multiplied it, uh, multiplied it by positive 12. Those should be the same magnitude but just opposite um, signs there for the momentum so that if you added it together you would end up with you know an overall zero momentum okay so hopefully that makes sense to you there so, uh, an 85 kilogram fisherman jumps from a dock into a 135.0 kilogram rowboat at rest on the west side of the dock if the velocity of the fisherman is 4.30 meters per second to the west as he leaves the dock, what is the final velocity of the fisherman and the boat? So I want you to take a second, draw the picture described by this problem, because uh, we said that's important skill for you to be able to do, and then um, you can see if you got what I get. All right, so here's the picture that I'm coming up with. Um, I've got my 85 kilogram fisherman, he's going to jump into that 135 kilogram rowboat and he's moving in a westerly direction or towards the left and the um, uh, initial velocity of the fisherman is going to be 4.30 meters uh, to the west as he leaves the dock and we're being asked here what's the final velocity of the fisherman and the boat? And that last question is really important but let's kind of go back to the beginning when the fisherman lands in the boat, is there going to be a collision or an explosion? Yes, that means that we can use our law of conservation of momentum uh, equation on this problem. So let's go ahead and expand that. Uh, there are two objects that are going to be part of this uh, collision uh, at the beginning, so we need to go ahead and expand that. We're going to use our momentum formula. Remember that momentum formula is mass times velocity. All right, so we're going to say the mass of the fisherman times the initial velocity of the fisherman plus the mass of the boat times the initial velocity of the boat equals, now we want to do the final over here. Now this is the neat part. When the fisherman jumps into the boat, um, they are both going to become like one object, okay? Because the fisherman will be sitting in the boat and then both of them are going to start moving off to the left. And hopefully that you can visualize that. If this fisherman guy were to jump into that boat, once he hits the boat, then his initial velocity to the west is going to cause the, the boat and him to start moving off towards the left, right? So they are acting as one object, which means that we can 
uh, we can say that their, their final velocity is going to be the same because the fisherman is going to be carried by the boat, right? So that means that, you know, we would say the, the mass of the fisherman times the final velocity of the fisherman plus the mass of the boat times the final velocity of the boat. However, we know that these two velocities here just are the same thing. So I'm just going to call that final velocity. All right? So let's rewrite this. We can say the mass of the fisherman times the initial velocity of the fisherman plus the mass of the boat times the initial velocity of the boat equals, and since this velocity and that velocity are the same, I can factor that out, right? So I can say the final velocity overall times the mass of the fisherman plus the mass of the boat. And that's the thing we're looking for is this final velocity. So to get it by itself, we'll just divide by the mass of the fisherman plus the mass of the boat on both sides of our equation over here. Mass of the fisherman plus mass of the boat. Okay, so that term goes away. And the boat is just sitting there, right? It says that the boat is sitting at rest. So no matter what the mass of the boat is, when I multiply it by the initial velocity of zero, that piece goes away. So we're going to say then that the final velocity of both objects is going to be equal to the mass of the fisherman, which is 85 kilograms, times the initial velocity of the fisherman, which is negative 4.30 meters per second, because he's moving to the left, divided by 85 kilograms plus 135.0 kilograms. Okay, so let's type that into our calculator and get a final answer. And when I do it, I'm getting negative 1.66 meters per second, or you could say that that's 1.66 meters per second to the west. So either of those would be correct uh, answers. All right. Okay, so here, uh, when can we use the conservation of momentum equation? All right. Um, obviously, whenever there's a collision or explosion, we've already said that, you can use it even if friction is present, okay? So this has, like, nothing to do with the conservation of mechanical energy equation, where you could only use that uh, when there is no friction. Um, you can only use it if there's multiple objects, right? You, you can't have um, uh, conservation of momentum if uh, there's only one object because you can't have one object collide with itself, right? There has to be at least two objects for some kind of a collision to occur. And then uh, the force of impact equation that we have in this section, remember, that's the force on only one object involved in the collision. And then you could apply Newton's third law to see, you know, what the equal and opposite um, force is going to be. All right. Okay, so next section, the impulse momentum theorem. So it says the force times the uh, duration, the, the duration of time of a collision, uh, is equal to the change in momentum, okay? And of course, that's the force of impact. The left-hand side of this equation uh, is what's known as the impulse, all right? And we actually have that rewritten down here. Impulse uh, sometimes gets uh, a new variable, capital J. So impulse can be equal to the change in momentum, but it could also be equal to the force of impact times the change in time. So impulse is actually both of those things. 
and it's kind of a, a weird <laughs> term because it's just like the you know the change in momentum so it's not really kind of its own standalone um, term or variable uh, it's really kind of um, a way of thinking about a collision all right so I'm just going to kind of point out a few highlights here of, of these other bullets you can think of the impulse as like the follow-through um, in some sporting events right so like if you if you're doing baseball okay and you you know you just kind of punt the ball then you're gonna have a very small change in momentum okay but if you follow through you keep the bat in contact with the ball for a longer amount of time then you're gonna have a greater impulse on the ball in other words it's gonna have a larger change in momentum another example here um, a person you know trying to break boards in karate if you just kind of smack the boards with your hand for you know just a moment you're not going to apply a large force there's not going to be a great change in momentum of your hand so you know the boards aren't going to break but if you rather than just you know hitting them for a moment you kind of push through in other words follow through uh, with that hit then uh, you're going to have a larger impulse on the boards means you're going to have a larger force of impact and you know you have, are more likely to break them okay so these you'll notice I did not box these are not boxed equations and that's because it stems from two equations that you already know uh, change in momentum and force of impact times change in time so uh, all you have to do is just put your your J in front of, of both of those one final thing I want to discuss about impulse are the units Okay, um, since we have uh, a formula that says that the impulse is the change in momentum, uh, we know that we would have kilograms times meters per second, right? The unit for mass times the unit for velocity. And then down here, we have force times time, so force is measured in newtons, and then course time is measured in seconds so uh, what are the correct units for impulse is it kilogram meters per second or is it Newton seconds well as it turns out impulse is always given or reported in terms of Newton seconds and that's kind of to help somewhat distinguish it from momentum okay so you will report kilogram meters per second exclusively for momentum uh, calculations and you will report with units of Newton seconds when you're doing impulse calculations. Uh, initial and final points in a momentum problem. Uh, this is important because it's different from energy problems. In an energy problem you get to pick what do you want the initial point to be, what do you want the final point to be, and where do you want your zero line to be and you can put it really anywhere you want any of those three things you just have to again be consistent when you choose to do it um, but in a collision problem a momentum problem you must put the initial uh, position at the beginning of the collision or explosion and you must put the final position at the end of the collision or explosion you have no choice you have to do it that way um, and that's because momentum is a vector quantity. The signs matter. So, you know, what's at the beginning and what direction it was moving in there, that matters. And what's at the end uh, and what direction is, is it moving in at the end, that matters. Whereas we know that work and energy are scalar terms. So, you know, direction and stuff can really be ignored. We don't have to really worry about that. Uh, we can kind of play around with where we want things to be because that, that part of the calculation just doesn't matter. Okay, let's do this practice question. A 2,250 kilogram pickup truck has a velocity of 25 meters per second to the east. What is the momentum of the truck? Okay, well this is just really basic. We know that momentum is equal to mass times velocity, so we just plug in. We know that the mass of the truck 2,250 kilograms. We know that the initial velocity or the velocity of the truck, not even initial, just the velocity, 25 meters per second to the east, so we know this is a positive number. So we just type that into our calculators and come up with the momentum uh, 
of the truck. So uh, when I do this, I'm getting 56,250, and then of course we know our units, kilograms, meters per second, and then we want our sig figs, uh, it looks like two sig figs, so 56,000 kilograms, meters per second. All right, let's take a look at this question. A 1,400-kilogram car moving westward with a velocity of 15 meters per second collides with a utility pole and is brought to rest in 0.3 seconds. Find the force exerted on the car during the collision. Okay, so this is obviously going to be a force of impact calculation. And we know that the force of impact is the change in momentum over the change in time, which means that it's the final momentum minus the initial momentum over the change in time, which means that it is the mass times the final velocity minus the mass times the initial velocity over the change in time. And of course, if we're talking about the same car, we can factor the mass out. So we'll, we can say that the force is equal to mass times final velocity minus initial velocity over the change in time. We're just kind of simplifying our equation there a little bit. And it says that it comes to a rest, which means that the final velocity is going to be zero. Okay, so. We've got mass times negative, because it's going to be zero minus the initial velocity, so we put that negative on the outside. And now the initial velocity was in the westward direction, so it's already negative. So we've got negative 15 meters per second over, now the duration of the collision was 0.3 seconds. And the mass was the 1,400 kilograms. OK, so let's type that into our calculator. Obviously, these two negatives here are going to cancel each other out. So we've got 15 uh, meters per second times 1,400 kilograms divided by 0.3 seconds. So let's type that in our calculator and come up with our force of impact. I am coming up with 70,000 Newtons. Uh, but if I look at all of my numbers up here, I'm seeing that I have to have two sig figs. And this number right here only has one sig fig. So we need to change that into scientific notation. So that's going to be 7.0 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4. 4 times 10 to the 4th Newtons. And this question asked what the force of impact is exerted on the car during the collision. So let's kind of draw ourselves a little picture, right? So it says that the car is moving in this westerly direction, and it's going to run into this utility pole, right? So as soon as the car runs into the utility pole, the force exerted on the car by the pole would be in this direction. Okay, So this needs to be a positive 7.0 times 10 to the fourth newtons because the direction of the force from the pole on the car is going to be to the right. If it had asked what was the force of the car on the utility pole, then we would have a negative number because the, the force of the car would be moving to the left. OK, uh, there are three types of collisions. The first one is an elastic collision. And of course, in an elastic collision, the objects are going to bounce off of each other. Um, and I'm going to actually kind of go into further detail about these in, in just a minute. 
Um, so there, there's something else about elastic collisions we need to know in just a little bit. The second type of collision is going to be a perfectly inelastic collision. And in that case, the objects are going to stick together during the collision. Um, so like, I don't know, maybe if you have two cars that crash into each other and they stick with each other and then move off in, in one direction, that would you know, be a perfectly inelastic collision. Um, or, you know, maybe you do a really bad job on your egg drop project and you drop the egg and it does not bounce off the ground in its little container. It crashes into the ground and sticks there. Okay, that would be a perfectly inelastic collision. And then the last one and the most common type, and it's very important that you know that, this is the most common, uh, in just a regular old inelastic collision. And this is kind of somewhere uh, a hybrid of the first two, all right, where it's going to... Uh, going to bounce, but it's not going to be a, um, a perfect collision, we'll say. All right, let's look at the next screen to kind of talk about that a little bit more in depth. All right, let's look at this chart here. In an elastic collision, momentum is conserved, of course, because it's a collision, and momentum is always conserved during all collisions and explosions. And then also, kinetic energy is conserved. So, for example, if I have, you know, a ball at some height above you know a surface here and I drop the ball and the ball hits the the surface and then it bounces all the way back up to its original height okay so we know that the ball at the beginning had some kind of gravitational potential energy which is going to be converted into kinetic energy on the way down and if it bounces all the way back up to the original height, then that means that it used up the same amount of kinetic energy on the way back up. So the kinetic energy was conserved. What went in is exactly what came out, all right? So the ball would have to return to the exact same height as, as what you dropped it from. And that's, I don't know that anybody's ever seen something like that. I don't know that you could tell me an example of something like that that you've seen before. Uh, you would have to put the ball, you know, bouncy ball or something like that into a vacuum in order to remove any kind of air resistance and, and stuff like that. And even still, once it hit uh, down here at the bottom, there's going to be some friction and stuff, and that's going to remove some energy from the system, so it still might not make it, you know, all the way up exactly where it left off from. So this is a, a really rare situation, you know, but it could exist where we would conserve uh, the kinetic energy as well. Then we have what was called a perfectly inelastic collision. Momentum will of course be conserved because it's a collision or an explosion, but in this case the kinetic energy is not going to be conserved because an object can be deformed. Right? So, And what that means is when it crashes uh, into the ground here, like for example this, this tennis ball, let's say if I draw a picture of the tennis ball um, at the surface, you know, right, right as it's crashing into to that uh, surface there, it's going to go from being this spherical object to, you know, kind of more of this oblong object here till it's, you know, kind of all the way flattened and then it'll start puffing back up again and getting ready to, to take off and, and go back up, okay? Now, that deformation is going to raise what's called the internal energy of the object, okay? And if you're increasing the internal energy of the object, you're, um, you're stealing, quote-unquote, energy from the system, which means the kinetic energy cannot be conserved and the ball will not return to the normal height or to the height from which it, it was dropped from. So let's kind of go down here and define, you know, what is internal energy, all right? Internal energy is going to be heat, sound, and sometimes light. When I drop a ball, you hear it when it hits. That, that required some energy to create vibrations in the air that traveled to your ears so that you finally heard it. That removed energy from the system. Um, when it hit the ground, there was a moment of friction between those two objects. Uh, and if you put your hands together and you rub them right now, you understand, uh, hopefully, that, that friction can increase 
the um, temperature of something. That, that change in um, kinetic energy there is going to raise the temperatures, and that gives off heat. That thermal energy is, again, being removed from the system. And then sometimes, um, depending on the, the situation, you could have uh, s some light being created. Uh, you know, you fire a bullet from a gun. The, um, the bullet, as it leaves the, the barrel of the gun, there's a, such a high amount of, of thermal energy being produced that it actually, you know, kind of glows. It gives off uh, light there. And there are other situations where light is given off, but that's just one example. So, um, you know, here's a little, uh, another example here. Friction uh, that's causing a ball to um, come to a stop. It's increasing the temperature of the ball and the ground that the ball is rolling along. You also hear the, the ball as it's rolling across the ground in some cases. So, again, that's internal energy that removes kinetic energy from the object. So, kinetic energy can't be conserved in a perfectly inelastic collision. So if you go back and look at the previous screen there, that is when the objects would uh, potentially stick together. Um, and then, of course, this case is also true in uh, just an elastic collision. Um, of course, momentum would be conserved, but the kinetic energy would not be conserved. They're not necessarily, the object's not going to stick to the ground in that situation. It's going to bounce back up. Uh, and I'm, again, I'm talking about an elastic, inelastic collision, not a perfectly inelastic collision. It would bounce back up, but it just wouldn't return to uh, the same height because it's, it's lost some energy uh, in the process. Okay, so that is our section on momentum. Uh, of course, we'll have worksheets and problems and stuff. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know, and we will work some more um, momentum questions in class uh, so if you have any, any other questions or whatever, maybe those can help you out as well. Thank you so much for learning with me today.